all they could basically do is buy and and basically try to sink ships in, in terror, terror. And in World War II, their subs weren't much better. You know, they couldn't break the blockade either. The subs were better. I mean, they had longer range subs. In '42, they had subs right up close to the United States when the Americans weren't ready to have convoy set up. It was kind of a disaster until you know we adapted. Sonar. All right. So, where do we finish here on Friday? Oh, which one? Oh, Ethiopia or Ethiopia. All right, here we go. So, what kind of pictures do you have to have? All right. All right, there's still a couple conversations going on now. We're starting. Here we go. So, we got this, right? We got Manchuria. Well, what were the laws that restricted the rights of Jews in Germany and passed in 1934? Passed. Yeah, the Nuremberg Laws. And what burnt down? I heard all kinds of names. The Reichstag. The Yep. And Hitler would use that as an excuse to take power. What was the name of the secret police? Gestapo. Who did Hitler have all the leadership killed off of? What was the group? He didn't really have control. They had the stormtroopers, the SA, the Knights of the Long Dives. So we got Manchuria, we got Ethiopia. So, boy, the 30s, something else. In the middle of the Depression, the Spanish Civil War. Over three and a half years of hell that Spain still hasn't quite recovered. Go to Barcelona, they're still talking about secession and they might do it. They're on the Republican side. A bloody, horrible civil war would happen in Spain. And this really would become then the fight against fascists and anti-fascists. A lot of Americans would join the anti-fascists. The Republicans were the government. They called the Republican, they had a popular front. Basically popular front of groups that were, um, People just wanted a Republican democracy, constitutional law, all the way to communists, anarchists, etc. They joined together in a government. And by 36, the swastika had become the generic symbol of fascism. By 36. So that's a anti-fascist model. The army. Theories of that, and a lot of more monarchists want to bring back the Spanish king who was deposed 20 years earlier, would begin a civil war. And they're going to be called the nationalists, or the nationalist side. And they were supported by the fascists. It's, it's not quite right to say they were fascists, but are all fascists, but it's much more complex than that. Francisco Franco, right here and here, would be the leader of the leader of the nationalists. He was an army general who was in Spanish Morocco, which was their colony, flew over with the help of Germany and Italy. And here is them getting rid of the, the Bolsheviks and the fascists and the communists. And Germans and Italians joined the nationalists. The Germans sent some troops, but the big thing they did is they sent airplanes. Airplanes that they had been working on in secret, and then eventually out in the open after 37, and to use here are German new dive bombers. And you'll notice they have a diagonal cross. So they can say, well, no, we're not really German, but yeah, everyone knew who they were. And an Italian legion of 50,000 troops joined the nationalists. This fight would be bloody, known for torture and terror bombing. And in 1939, the Nationalists didn't win. A number of Americans did volunteer for what's known as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, but the U.S. stayed neutral. That's where anti-fascist would really become, or the name would come out, anti-fascist, that some people say had to put to the today, which is kind of humorous how little people know about it in reality. But that came about because of anti-fascists in Italy. They remained in power, the fascists, until 1976. And there's Franco right there. These are more Republican soldiers who surrendered. The Soviets did help a little bit, but the Soviets wanted to maintain control, and they only would help those 
who were loyal to the Soviets, whatever that might mean in Spain. But it seemed like fascism was like the new way. No, they can't be stopped. Democracies are weak. And it seemed to many that maybe Mussolini, therefore Hitler, were right. Democracies where people were worried about individual rights made you selfish and greedy and didn't care about the greater good. You aren't important, it's the greater good. Now, fortunately for the Allies and probably for, and for Spain too, they were so devastated by the war, they never did join the Axis to Nazi Germany in this war. They remained neutral. How would the United States treat Spain after World War II, considering that they were fascists? They're anti-what? Fascist, what is the organizing principle of fascism? Anti-what? Anti-communism. So we started sending them weapons. Cold War. Yeah. And they became an indirect, technically not outlet because they're fascists, but yeah, we soon had an Air Force base there. And yeah. So all it's forgotten in the Cold War, we allied ourselves with fascists. And nearly dropped them in, or nearly uh, destroyed part of the Spanish coast with a 20 megaton nuclear bomb accidentally dropped on them. That's another story. So here's the biggie. March of 1936, the Rhineland. The Rhineland's the area of Germany, right here, that was demilitarized. The Treaty of Versailles said no troops here, so it'll be a buffer for France. No troops right here. And you can imagine Nazis, the whole National Socialist argument was the Treaty of Versailles was this horrible crime against them. So Hitler had been talking about sending troops across. Now, he had secretly increased the size of the army from 100 to about 300,000, but it still was really small. So he was going to roll the die. He ordered his troops to march in. There was cavalry and there's German soldiers marching in. It's called militarize. They're going to militarize the right. They militarize the right. But Hitler was terrified. I don't know why I wrote down nervous, but he was nervous. He gave orders to his generals. There were Brotswich, the head of the great German general staff. Retreat if the French do anything. Because the French have a powerful army of over 2 million men, well-equipped, well-armed. Uh, you know, I didn't say well-led. But if the French do anything, this would have been, or this, I'm sorry, this was one of the most important moments in world history. If the French would have acted aggressively and Hitler would have pulled back, he would have been humiliated. This would have changed the entire course of history. He was rolling the die that the French wouldn't do anything. This was a key moment. But what of Britain and France? France kind of wanted to do something, but they were devastated by the Depression. Britain, also devastated by the Depression, they really didn't want war. And the argument in Britain is kind of persuasive. Does anybody in Britain want to fight and die so Germany can't send troops into Germany? They're not invading another country. This is Germany. Anybody in here willing to die for that? Well, besides a few lunatics, yeah. But the point is, no, Britain, no, we don't, we don't want to do this. We don't want to fight and die for this. It's not worth it. Who cares? Let them. The treaty, we didn't like the Versailles Treaty anyways. So they did nothing. They did one of those, oh, you shouldn't do that. And you can imagine it's going to be overjoyed, joy, uh, joyous uh, greeting inside of the Rhineland. The Germans you know, greeted them coming in and, and made people think the Versailles Treaty was thrown out. This is the most important example, probably the most crucial one on a term called appeasement. Appeasement is giving or giving to aggression. Because the idea is if you give in to one, they'll keep asking for more. And what did Hitler immediately announce out in the open? We're gonna increase the size of the army and he started conscription and another ad police openly rearming. They were doing it in secret and now we have an air force. That was banned, now we're gonna have it, no one's gonna stop us. They announced they're building battleships. That was banned by the treaty. And their army's gonna be 500,000 strong. 
and they began to openly rearm, violating the Treaty of Versailles. And so this ceremonial march that everybody has called goose stepping would become kind of a symbol of Nazi Germany and fascism and the clever cartoon goose stepping over the Treaty of Versailles. This was the moment, probably the best chance to stop Hitler, at least by the Allies, before Germany got too strong um, to avoid war. This hindsight's a beautiful thing, but this was the moment, and they didn't do it. Everyone's going to talk about Munich, which we'll get to in a second, but the Rhineland was key. The Rhineland was key. And so I got rearm. And the generals by 38, you know, they know we're going to have war in the East. And they make it very clear to Hitler, we should be fully mobilized and ready for war. You're training new, because the army was so small, so train officers and non-commissioned officers. And they, they said, okay, Germany will be ready for the war that Hitler wanted and the generals wanted in 1945. We'll be ready for that war. What is ironic about being ready for the war in 1945? Yeah, the war was over in 1945. That should also give us a little bit of a start. They weren't ready, and they almost won. So, after this, Italy and Germany, the Rome Berlin, would start the Rome Berlin Axis, anti comintern or anti communist alliance. You also see it called the Pact of Steel. Four years later, Japan would join this, and this is where they get the access, the access powers. It's basically a linking between Berlin and Rome against the Soviets. And when Hitler took power, Mussolini was seen on the rise. It is totally reversed now. Italy was more and more being seen as kind of a junior part partner. Mussolini would become the, a butt of jokes in three or four years, and Hitler was on the rise. Just weird to think about how quick that happened. So 1938, Anschluss, Germany once again violated the Treaty of Versailles and forcibly annexed or unified with Austria. Austria was a German-speaking country. Remember, it was a big empire before World War I. And right here, they violated the treaty and occupied this. The, remember, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. Yeah. Is it 1935? Did I say 35? I meant 38. Okay. Yeah. You're saying two different things. 1938. Once again, the league did nothing. Same deal. You can imagine people were saying, who cares? Let Hitler take Austria. That's it. I mean, what else is he going to do? So, obviously going through very fast. Not going to go through all the politics of this. So, then Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was a republic, independent, Allied with Britain and France, had a strong military with really strong defenses in the Carpathian Mountains. But there was an area of Czechoslovakia along the border where they had ethnic Germans. They had never been part of Germany, they were part of the old Austrian Empire, but where, or in the mountains called the Sudetenland, about 60% of the population there were ethnically Germans. So what did Hitler say? Czechoslovakia is mistreating the Sudeten Germans. And unless they turn that area over, Germany will, will invade. I thought this is an interesting map from Time Magazine comparing Czechoslovakia to the size of Florida. In 1938, yeah, this is, well, this was 17 years ago. Yeah, the fort, they have these, all these elaborate forts and they're all still there. These Czech hedgehogs. The Germans took a bunch of them and then made more and put them all over the beaches in France. You might have heard of D-Day. So, the German minority, and they claimed they were going to invade. Now, so he's once again betting that Britain and France will be too afraid or too unprepared to go. And he was right. They totally had it. Now, here is a cartoon implying that Britain and France will fight. No. They both didn't want the war. Same argument. Do you want to fight and die for Czechoslovakia? And especially Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Britain, he was desperate for peace. 
He really thought, okay, Hitler is just kind of pressing against that. He's just trying to get these German ethnic groups, and either that will be it, or in three or four more years, we'll be more prepared for war. If we have to have war, we need this extra time. Or maybe just give them enough. And the Rhineland's already in the past. Hitler actually wants war. Chamberlain's going to fly, never flew in a plane before, he's in his 70s, fly twice to Munich to meet with Hitler. Didn't want to go to Berlin, you know, the capital. So Hitler, his brand new, ugly, granite Nazi headquarters in Munich, they met there, which is now an art school. So you can go visit the art school. I walked around and I met the headmaster. But at Munich, <coughs> four countries represented by their executives. Hitler, Germany, Mussolini. He was kind of the translator. He could speak, what, seven languages, five fluently? So I can imagine him strutting and preening and showing off. And he's not biased at all. Chamberlain of Britain and then Delatier, the premier of France. So Mussolini, Hitler, Delatier, Chamberlain. And basically, especially Chamberlain, but they're desperate to avoid a war with those four. So Germany, Italy, Britain, France. Desperate. And they came up with an agreement. And there's Hitler signing agreement. I'll explain that little piece of paper in just a second. And this was a classic example. This would become the prototypical advanced <coughs> example of a people. Hitler can have the Sudeten. He can have it. And so there is Mussolini shaking hands with Chamberlain right there. And then Hitler signed a paper basically saying, that's all. That is all. That is all. Follow up. I'm done. Signed a paper. Chamberlain would go back to Britain and wave this paper to a cheering crowd, promising peace in our time. Delatier would go back to France, and he actually thought, they're going to lynch me. I, we have given away everything we have, and we're going to have a horrible war. But he was met by thousands cheering him. Peace. They brought peace. Overjoy with this. Well, as we know now... Hitler was lying. I don't know if you knew that. Hitler lied. I know I, that didn't. <coughs> but that's before we get to that. Did I just dash your hopes? Who wasn't there? Wasn't there. The checks weren't there. Oh, this cartoon hints at one other person. And Stalin wasn't there. And so the checks were stabbed in the back by their <laughs> allies. This is a cartoon of them toasting the Munich Agreement, and there's the, pre, uh, the premier of Czechoslovakia, his picture looking off. Um, oh, and the Spanish Civil War was going on, so it was supposedly they were supposed to talk about that. And there was an Arab revolt in the British colony of Palestine, partially over the British support of Zionism. What a time. And Stalin was furious. And he knew Britain and France hated them. He knows Germany hates them. He had just purged most of his officers. He's a, whole, a brutal dictator. And here it's implying that he's kind of like hmm, happy about it. No, he's mad and worried about being totally isolated in this war. So, the poor Czechs. So Munich will become synonymous with appeasement. So here, this is a pro-Chamberlain cartoon staring down Mars, the god of war. But here is Hitler walking over these countries and these spineless leaders of the democracy. Democracies are weak. That's the essence of that. Munich will not end there. So whenever people would talk about that's another Munich, they're talking about this agreement. Now, I have to be clear. The Rhineland was the time where they could have stopped Hitler. And that appeasement could change everything. That appeasement helped encourage Hitler, saved him. He might not have survived. It was already, the war is inevitable. It was inevitable. But it become 
It's anonymous. I just heard somebody on the radio this morning say, we can't allow another Munich. This morning. They talk about it all the time. My guess is the person saying that has no idea what they're talking about. They were told, say it's like music, Munich, and, you, and people will think you're smart. Because from the Cold War through today, people will use Munich as a reason to justify war and intervention. We have to go to war because we can't allow another Munich. And this would be used all the way from a civil war in Greece in 1947 that would trigger the massive arms race, the Korean War, a civil war in South Vietnam, all the way to two different attack invasions of Iraq, overthrowing democracies in Iran. Heck, we got lots of things here. So this is him with that waving that piece of paper, that's Neville Chamberlain. And then all these are examples where war would be justified by Munich. So the United States was involved with a little conflict over the weekend. A massive, unprecedented attack took place. Iran attacked Israel. With uh, first time Iran has ever attacked anybody, uh, an offensive action by Iran since like the 18th century. And they've been attacked, but they've never <coughs> attacked anybody. Israel bombed their consulate in Syria, murdering eight people. And Israel, I mean, this is just, it's, it's kind of unprecedented. They used drones and missiles. They, Iran didn't really want it to work all that well because they warned everybody it's going to attack and they didn't really hide it. I think it was more like to prove to their own people were, were attacking, but they, U.S. fighter planes were involved shooting down these missiles. The United States was directly involved, and now Israel is saying they attacked us and now we must escalate. They escalate. We will be <coughs> as a nation. This is actually, we are right on the edge of war. Big war, major war. What? We don't know. Israel. So, so, so. Well, on the radio this morning, someone talking about Israel trying to push them to attack said, "We can't appease Iran. We don't want another." Meeting. So they literally were saying it this morning. I wonder if that guy, I really, I do wonder if they knew anything about, about Munich. And so they still use it to this day. And so what is the lesson we really can learn from Munich? I've already told you. Don't trust him. Other than that, every situation is unique and every situation is complex. And even though Derek might be right about what he said about Israel and Gaza, they are not exactly acting rationally. <coughs> and so if we have, this might surprise you. Outside of here, people act irrational. In here, we're always rational. But I know, I know what you're saying. I'm just saying that. You're not all rationality anymore. So as it turned out, Hitler lied. Six months later, they took all the tickles of Slovakia. Poor Czechoslovakia. Now completely surrounded, all their best defenses gone, alone, they gave in without a fight. And here it is, the mocking the note, and it says, I will be good, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I find that rather clever in a dark way. And so, Portugal, Slovakia, it's going to be split in half. The Slovaks, who always felt mistreated, would form a kind of a rump state under control, a German puppet state. The rest of it's going to become absorbed into greater Germany. Uh, the Ruthi Ruthiania, I am mispronouncing that. The Ruthians, they're Ukrainians. So they formed a kind of a puppet little government there. Remember, remember we talked about this. It's a hodgepodge of different ethnic groups all over. So let's go back just a little bit. While this is going on, in between Munich, I don't even know how I do. Let me tell you about monopolies. Okay. 
Why we don't like monopolies? Sorry, it froze. Are you? I said you had to wait that long. No, I was so this time Chamberlain vows I will stop Hitler and both Britain and France became to, began to frantically try to rearm. So there's the Nazi tiger, and you see the umbrella? That would become a symbol for years, all the way up to the 70s, the symbol of appeasement. It rained a lot in Britain, so the idea of an, of, of an Englishman carrying an umbrella, appeasement. And so, Crystal Knot. This actually happened in between Munich and taking the rest of Czechoslovakia or the night of the broken glass. What happened was, there was a, a German diplomat, what part of the diplomatic staff in Paris, was assassinated by a German, a young German Jewish man who had fled Germany, assassinated this diplomat. And Hitler would use that as an excuse for an organized attack on Jews. These are known as a pogrom. So technically the German government wasn't involved, but it was the idea that the German people are so mad they have no choice but to attack Jewish owned stores with all the broken windows, the night of the broken glass. There's the biggest Jewish synagogue in Berlin burning. A massive attack on Jews. A number of Jewish leaders would be arrested and put in concentration camps for their own protection. This was to drive Jews out of Germany before the war. About half of all Jews had already fled, and about half of the remaining Jews would flee. Yeah. Why was this an excuse for the war? An excuse for it's called a pogrom. A pogrom is an organized attack on Jews. Or actually, an organized attack on anybody, but normally we associate it with against Jews. It's a, it's a Russian term. And so this is, the, this is basically Hitler's way of saying war is coming. So we're trying to get this enemy within out. Because once war begins, they can't go anywhere. The borders are shut off, obviously. And remember total war, no dissent. And if an enemy is within, that might cause a downfall of the country. They've got to be silenced. The horrible logic of total war. You might remember the Ottoman Empire and the Armenians. So these dots, all these are cities where there was destruction of Jewish owned businesses, homes, etc. Here's Hitler looking at the rubble, and of course, who was blamed? The Jews, because it was, it was their very presence that caused good Germans to react that way. And that leads right into the next big issue: the Polish corridor. This little finger of land separating Germany into two. They give Poland access to the sea. All these kind of aqua areas are ethnic German. So again, Hitler is saying they're being mistreated. But Hitler thinking, what if Britain and France actually might, what if they do something this time? Because once again, they vowed to defend Poland. Since he won another two front war like World War One, And so knowing that Stalin is upset at Britain and France, especially after Munich. They asked the Soviets, would you like to talk? It blew everybody away. And it led to the mortal enemies, mortal enemies coming together. You see all kinds of names, the German-Russian um, pack, Usually Hitler, Stalin, sometimes Molotov, Ribbentrop, Ribbentrop. 
there's Molotov, there's Ribbentrop, the foreign ministers of both countries, a non-aggression pact. And they basically agreed to both attack poor Poland. Poland had no idea. Poland had been terrified of both Germany and France, or Germany and the Soviets for years, and they have good reason to be. Also, Germany or Russia, we use this as an excuse to take places like Lithuania and Latvia. But also the big thing was trade. It opened up trade. German technology flew eastward, um, flowed eastward, but the biggie, oil. Germany did not have oil. So these are two really good cartoons. I wonder how long the honeymoon will last. Pretty clever. But I really like this one. Someone is taking someone for a walk, but it's Stalin, Hitler, and I love the pistols behind their back. And oil. This area right here is some of the richest oil producing areas in the world. And once Hitler had this, I should add, communist parties all over the world that were looking to Stalin to stop fascism would be just crushed by this and they never recover. The Communist Party was big in the United States, destroyed and never recovered, ever, to this day. So World War II would begin on that note. I didn't, do I have the date down? I don't know if I put down the date, so put down September 1st, 1939. That's a French tank. French have good tanks, really good tanks. They just didn't have, uh, they put radios on them and they weren't very well done. What's happening? September 1st, 1939. They had better plans than the Germans. So, Europe. That's why Europe looks at one of those Time Magazine maps. And by the way, here are people fleeing to America, even though they didn't really let anybody in. And an armed camp. They knew war was coming. And so, here now, this is Germany. And look at poor Poland. Surrounded all the way here now, and then they have no idea the Soviets are coming too. So, do you want to see another very accurate representation of the situation Poland was in? You want to see it? I like that one a lot. Whoever came up with that was pretty clever, I think, really clever. So, September 1st, I did write it down. I forgot if I wrote it down. September 1st, 1939. Germany did one of those, like, Poland attacked our radio station. You know, they lie through the teeth and attack. Poland tried to defend their entire border, stretching their armies thin. And Germany had adopted a new tactic. Now, this tactic actually is kind of, it's a new version of an old tactic. But they gave it, it worked great for propaganda. They, like, we reinvented war. And they called it Lightning War or Blitzkrieg. And it was focused on all the armor and tanks. Instead of being spread out, they put them on four cores, basically here, here, and here, here. And the goal was simple. Use the tanks all in one spot, punch through, and then go. Encircle here, encircle here. And the poles were still... The Poles were still thinking it was 1920. This is not a lot different than the, the German attack in 1918 that broke through the trench line. But now they're using tanks. And the German tanks were not very good. But the Poles really didn't have any tanks. Poles didn't have an air force. And so it seemed like it was an invincible new way to fight. And German propaganda is really going to ex accelerate this. And so there's Hitler invades Poland. That's the London... That's a London Evening News, have this. Or here's another newspaper headline. Okay, that's The Onion, that's satire. Here's your lives as Belgium hides. Yeah, I love it. Japan forms alliance with white, supreme white supremacists in a well thought out scheme. I gotta admit, that's pretty clever. Oh, begins construction of the world's biggest power. Yeah. Okay, so Britain and France do declare war. They do declare war. And this, wow, they meant it. Or did they? Britain has a tiny little army. 
They did initiate the draft, but it's going to be a long time until they're ready to fight. France is calling for the reserves, and they're calling up men as old as their early 40s to go fight. The French population is 60% that of Germans, and so they are at a severe disadvantage. If they would have acted aggress aggressively right there, there was virtually no German forces in the West. But they remembered World War I, and they thought if we sit in our defenses and let the Germans attack us, we'll crush them. We'll just kill them. And so that was their plan. And so Poland would be overwhelmed and a little bit over a month. Poor Poland. No Air Force. And the German planes had flaws, but when you're fighting against countries without any defenses, it was not a big deal. Two weeks after the Polish army had been basically defeated, two weeks after Germany invaded, then the Soviets attack and clean up the mess and take what they want. Poor Poland is going to go through one of the greatest war crimes ever committed, mostly by Germany, but also the Soviet Union. Poor Poland. And the second, pop second largest population of Jews in the world is Poland. The largest population in the Soviet Union. And 90% of those Jews would be killed. And so, after this, Japan joined the Axis. That is where we get the Berlin, Tokyo, or the Berlin, Rome, Tokyo, however you want to say it. And sometimes you might see it called the tripartite pact, sometimes the anti commenter which means anti-communist. As long as you know the Axis, you're in good shape. Now, Japan, this was not a coordinated alliance. This is more for propaganda for both. Germany was hoping Japan would attack Siberia and occupy the Soviet Union there. Japan actually did get into two battles with the Soviet forces in 39 and 40 and did not do well and did not want to fight them. So the United States remained neutral throughout this. They passed four separate neutrality acts in the 1930s. We're not going to get into another war for banks. And in 1939, the United States, the last neutrality act would be cash and carry. And cash and carry meant the United States would, we would sell to Britain and France, but no debt, no bonds. You have to have cash on the barrel right there, meaning cash backed by what? Yeah, and they wanted gold. And here, Roosevelt desperately trying to get the United States more involved. He sees the existential threat of fascism. Here he is talking to Congress as Europe burns. And here, you might recognize this artistic style. Here's a very famous political cartoonist writing about Uncle Sam and separate breads as Europe goes through, or um, I like the Italian mumps, <laughs> as Europe has its own sickness. Dr. Seuss. So the United States stayed out of this, partially because, what's it going? OK, let's get this last part done. America First Committee. The America First was a hodgepodge of different people who wanted the United States to remain neutral. Some were people who just feared banks getting rich because of the war. They believed that war, another war like World War I, would do nothing but cause more pain and suffering or were outright anti-Semites anti and or pro-Nazis, like a rabid anti-Semite by the name of Charles Lindbergh. Remember him? Flew across the Atlantic solo, one of the most famous Americans. And here is another cartoon by Dr. Seuss mocking the America first for staying out of the war. And I really like this. It says, and the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their bones. But those were foreign children, and it really did. Now, he's attacking the people who believe that. But that's a pretty common belief that's very xenophobic. It goes on to this day. And so here is Lindbergh receiving a baton and a medal. That's the medal he got from Reichsfuhrer of Germany and the head of the Air Force, German Air Force, the German Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering. And then you see these. And these are going to be shown a lot of American firsts, including Montana Senator Burton K. Wheeler. He was, he was more opposed to banks. But what are they doing? 
Yeah, and what are they? What are they doing? What are they? What are they saying? What are they saying? No. The what? They're doing the pledge of allegiance. They're doing the pledge of allegiance, and people think, and they'll, they'll, this will be posted. See, the American first are a bunch of fascists. They're taking advantage of people not knowing stuff. And then once, once, um, once you guys heard pledge of allegiance, you're like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Doesn't mean they're not, you know. So in the United States of the war, Lindbergh begged to get a commission in the Air Force. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not done yet. Put the phones away. He begged for a commission to get in the Air Force. And Roosevelt refused and made it very clear. Nobody trusts you. And nobody wants you in the United States Air Force. So the most famous American from the 1920s would not be allowed to fly for his country. Which, yeah, I kind of, I got to be honest with you, I agree with that. So, tomorrow, oh, I hope everyone's working on the review packet. It's due tomorrow. It's due May 13th. As we get closer, I'll start to, I'll, I'll, set up, I'll set up review sessions, and I will go through lots of stuff. You have to do the first six pages and page 11. Then the rest of it, you have to just do something. Okay, the World War II one, I want those ones with asterisks on my Wednesday. The rest of it, you know, I'm going to cover the class, so you can add it to it or just use your notes. Yeah, in your textbook, chapter 26, I believe, whatever the World War II chapter is. I think it's labeled World War II. Okay. I was not to get a and now